A big hello and a very warm welcome to a special show right here on ET Now. I'm at Shi Rose in Mumbai and I'm being joined by two very distinguished guests, both CEOs. One is what I call a millennial CEO, the other is a more older experienced CEO. I have with me today representing the millennial CEOs, Mitu Chandelia, CEO Air Asia, and representing the older experienced CEO is none other than the PepsiCo CEO, Shiv Kumar. We're not really going to debate uh, as to which is better, but we're really going to try and bring to the fore the differences of approach and style between, let's say, a millennial CEO and, of course, an experienced older CEO. Thank you so much, both of you, for taking time out and joining us today right here on ET Now. Pleasure. So I'm going to start really with you, Mitsu, because uh, at 35, it's commendable. Uh, I think you took over when you were 33. 32. 32. What would you say <clears throat> are, let's say, the biggest trials uh, a young CEO goes through? Well, I, I think the obvious one is um, uh, gaining credibility, gaining respect. Let me come to you, Shiv. You may have no such, uh, you know, troubles uh, because your progression has been, <clears throat> you know, uh, you, you're at your age is respectable to a CEO, if I have to say that. Uh, do you think, as one of the more experienced CEOs in the country, do you think, given the fact that you know you're dealing with so much more uh, young people, millennials, centennials, that you know you're finding it as an older CEO tough to navigate through, let's say. Uh, this new age? Uh, starting with uh, your first point, and I think Mark Twain said it best. He said, uh, age is an issue of mind over matter. Okay. Okay, if you don't mind it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, so I think that's what you should look at. To me, uh, anybody, you know, not just an executive, uh, not just a senior manager, but a CEO, you become old the day you stop learning. Remember that. So age is not the reason for being a CEO ever. Mm. So when you are a young CEO, let's take like Mithu, the big choice you have is, okay, what are you going to do for the next 25 years of your life? Because you're going to be CEO for 25 years of your life. That's true. That's, That's not true. an easy journey. That's true. <laughs> so I was one of the younger CEOs in India in my early 40s, sure. 41, 42. Sure. I really needed to think, what am I going to do till I retire in, in the next 20 years? Sure. So you have to pace yourself well. Uh, that's one. Second is the tenure of CEOs and the industry you work in is very important. Okay. Today, the average tenure of an Indian CEO is about four years. Okay. So you can't say, I've got this job, I'm going to do this for 10 years. It doesn't work. Okay. Next is, you can be a, you have CEOs who are old and young. You can have industries which are old and young. Yeah. So Mithun, Mithu is in a very old industry, That's true. a challenged industry, That's where true. the industry has made three years of global profits in 45 years. Okay, so if you're a young CEO, the expectations are, will he deliver on profitability? On the other hand, if you're in a young industry like e-commerce in India today, nobody bothers about the bottom line. That's okay. true, yeah. And so if you have a map, so there'll be young industries which need old CEOs and experienced CEOs, and there'll be old industries which need young shaking up, both. Mm. And the biggest difference in, in India today, as well as globally, is the presence of the millennials. Okay. Today, 65% of my organization is millennials. Okay. Okay. And the millennial route is a very different route of leadership. You overlay millennial, millennials with digital. What digital does for millennials is it takes away the, what, the layers between the top to the bottom. Absolutely. Today, most companies have maximum six layers. But what continues in most organizations is the horizontal you know, boundaries. Sure. And I think millennials don't like that. And I think a role of a very good CEO is to orchestrate the organization mm -hmm. and move them from one mindset to another mindset. Two, three points, uh, you know, taking, uh, uh, taking this further. One is that you talked about the millennials today. Your team, you're saying, you know, 70%, 80% are millennials. True. And the way they want to be treated uh, is very different as opposed to, let's, let's say, the non-millennial or the, or the generation before that. Can you give me a sense of how it was earlier and then juxtapose it with how the millennials want to be treated today? Please. Great question. Today, employees, the millennials, okay, they do not have the same loyalty which you had 20 years ago. Sure. And you can't expect it. That's fair. But they want the same job security from the employer. And that's the challenge. The employer cannot do that. Yeah. And you know, if I could add one more thing to that. Apart from wanting that security and apart from you know, them being volunteers, they also constantly want to be engaged. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, they want to feel like they own this business, that they have the empowerment, that they're delegated down to. So it's not only about you know, creating that environment for them. I think this is where leaders, regardless whether they're old, new, I think they're going to be tested at their most. 
And like Shiv said, you know, in a digital world, everything's transparent. But I so, want to ask you a direct question from, from you know, some of the stuff that he said, which is he said the millennials today, and I'm asking you this because you know you're a millennial CEO. Yeah. Is he said they don't look at their uh, tenure with the company as a life, to, a life, lifelong membership. Let's say like our parents did. Uh, as opposed to you know that you're a professional and these you're, you're just rendering services and you may be you may free to, uh, to be rendering your services elsewhere, uh, you know in a few years. Uh, so would you be in agreement with the way uh, that's the way the millennial approach is? No, absolutely. I, I think you know Shiv hit it right on the head. People are in this learning mode. They want to learn as much as they can. They want to deploy that learning in in a, in a setting that will give them the opportunity to do so, and then they want to move on. Right. Now it is our job as leaders to make sure that they have enough of those opportunities within our own company to keep them engaged, keep them learning, keep them, you know, have a broader canvas that they can kind of deploy a lot of those learnings and make those mistakes mm -hmm. and learn from it again and move on. If we don't, I don't think the loyalty to brands or companies uh, that I'm, you know, I, I've seen my dad go through, it, it's not there in today's sure. world. I want to talk to you specifically about, you know, loyalty. and. Do you think then, would you be in agreement that loyalty is no more, there's no, loyal, no premium attached to loyalty anymore? Would you say that that's a fair statement to make and would you be in agreement with that? You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't agree with it entirely. I think there is a, there is a premium you can put on loyalty, but there, you know, it's not loyalty over performance. I think that's changed. Uh, look at loyalty stroke commitment and yeah. I'm using that. Yeah. Thing. Sure. The concept of that is different in a digital world. <clears throat> See, earlier, people went to office 9 to 5. Somebody who came on time, left on time, or left at 7 o'clock, you said he's a hardworking guy, he's committed to the company. Today, thanks to digital, you have SMSs, you have email, you have WhatsApp floating around, etc. A lot of the millions, millions don't want to be disturbed after 7 o'clock. They have their own life. But so is it, does it actually happen? It does happen. There are a lot of people who keep SMSing, etc. So people say, hey, give me my own life. So their concept of commitment and loyalty is, in the time that I work, am I producing the results? Please judge me on that, which is fair. Yeah, that's true. And this is something which happens only in India. Yeah. The millenn millennials are a wonderful, what I call, uh, you know, white collar union when it comes to promotions and perks, etc. <laughs> They'll say, you know what? My batchmate of 1982 has got this car, so why am I not getting it? My batchmate of, uh, you know, 1995 has got a promotion. Why don't I get it? Right. So when it matters, they, are, they have a union. When it doesn't matter, you need to treat them as individuals. And that is the skill of leadership. Right. To recognize and give them the freedom to express mm. both points of view, but in being fair and honest with them. I want to pivot back to really see your talk and really, you know, uh, young versus experienced. Uh, and, you know, I want to bring you in, Mithu, on, mm -hmm. you know, how tough has it been for you, mm -hmm. given you know that you're so young, given the fact that you know you you've come in, you don't have exper sector experience, mm -hmm. uh, you were a model before this. Mm -hmm. um, how difficult has it been to prove to your you know environment uh, that you know you are a credible, b take me seriously. Mm. Well, you know since we hit that topic, let me put this out there. I was a model many years ago. <laughs> it wasn't something. <laughs> that, that was not a profession. That wasn't a profession. Just, it was a hobby. <laughs> and that was making ends meet yeah. in, in a tough life in New York. Um, no, but, but I think it's a, it's a very apt question in the sense of if you are somebody young who's come into a role, um, that many people may think that, you know, who's this young kid? Does he really deserve that? I think it puts a lot more onus on yourself. My perspective is I'm not there to please the broader audience. I'm not playing to an audience. My responsibility is number one, to my team and my shareholders and making sure that we're delivering to our customers a promise that we made. And if I can do that and do that great every day, I think that's, that's good enough for me. Would you say then that the personal toll it takes on you as a young CEO, let's say as opposed to a more experienced CEO, let's say Shiv for instance, right? Uh, because you're con not only trying to deliver as, as a CEO, but you're also always fighting uh, uh, you know, all the other obstacles that you face because of your age, th that, you know, you know, you, the frustration levels can be quite, quite uh, high as opposed to, let's say, somebody, uh, you know, who's, mm -hmm. who's, you know, uh, you know suitable to be CEO because of, the, yeah. because of his age or her age. You see, I think the personal frustrations or the stress would be significantly more if you're not honest with yourself and honest with your team. So right from day one, when I took on the role and when I started putting this 
team together, the number one things I've always told them is, this is what I know, this is what I don't know. I had people come to me later and say, you know, I don't think you should say that, you know, and Publicly. admit you. <laughs> admit you. And I said, no, because I want, this is the reason I have you. You're my complement. You're the folks that are going to be the advisors. I'm always going to be the person who's going to take that call. It will be my call, but I'm always going to hear from you, and that's why I have you. If, I'm, if I can do each one of your roles better than you, then I'm not the kind of CEO that I want to be. I think they feel uncomfortable with being asked to do things in a very different way. Like, they, you know, I've heard when I first came in, I used to come to work in an auto. <laughs> and one of them came to me and said, I'm going to resign because everyone's saying that my CEO comes in an auto. I just did that because it was the fastest way to work. Going back to what you started with, now I said, you know, mind over matter. If you look at a CEO in his 30s, we see Visavi a CEO in his 50s. What's going on in their mind? The, the guy who is in the 30s is thinking about wife, family, having kids, what do I do, what's my future like, etc. next 20 years. The guy in his 50s is worried about his children's education, he's worried about his parents' health, He is worried about what are the boards he'll get onto after he retires. They're very different mindsets uh, out there, completely different things, what's occupying their minds. You know, so it's not the same thing, okay? Age does play a role, but it plays a role in terms of games in your mind, in terms of what you yes. should be focusing on. The other thing also, in older organizations, like, uh, you know, and older industries, you have four generations of people in the company. Yeah. Okay, whether you're a young CEO or, you know, experienced CEO, you better know how to fuse all four Gs to work for you. <laughs> okay, you're truly in the 4G and the 5G mold now. You really have to make them work for you. It's a very different thing as opposed to what you're doing before. Well, both of you all have been very kind and spoken about the fact that, you know, if mind over matter, age is in the mind, all of that. I still want to focus on the boon and bane of experience and age, right? Uh, so, you know, for instance, uh, some people have actually documented this and said that young CEOs are more energetic, uh, are more innovative, have higher risk appetites, right? Uh, and, you know, older CEOs are much more skilled at managing both people, processes, and environment. Uh, would you say that that is a fair assessment? I think, I think to a certain degree, yes. You know, I, I would agree with that. But I think it has to do a lot with the context of their own life stage, like we just spoke about. I think younger CEOs probably are more energetic, probably are more willing to take those risks, because personally, they're in that frame of mind. If this doesn't work out, or if they make a mistake, they will learn from it, and they'll move, you know, and, and own that decision and move on. And if it doesn't work out here in that entire setup, they'll move on to something entirely different. You have some really outstanding CEOs in the 50s who are what we call servant leaders, mm. okay, who are level five Perfect. servant <laughs> leaders who've done a fantastic job. Absolutely. Okay, so to my mind, I think stereotyping something is a big challenge. Like for example, if, if I wear a tie, you can call me formal. Yeah. If I wear a t-shirt, you can call me informal. But the stereotyping, it has nothing to do with, you know, whether my sure. clothes represent something or my age represents something. In FMCG companies, we place a great emphasis on brand management. Brand managers have absolutely no authority over anybody in the company, but they're fully accountable. And when they have absolutely no power, if a good brand manager can orchestrate a company around his brand, imagine what he will do when he becomes a CEO. Yeah. That's why great brand managers make very good CEOs, because Without authority, they're able to orchestrate something. And sure. those are the kind of things you need to look sure. for. I want to talk about use of technology, especially mm -hmm. social media, and how a young, young CEO uses it versus, let's say, a more, an older CEO. For instance, you're pretty active on social media. I don't know if you have a Twitter account no. also. You don't have a Twitter like account, that. right? So, and this is, I mean, I think, I think you are a representation of, of, your in, of your entire generation. I mean, whether it's marketers, um, when it's, I mean, our chief marketing officers or its CEOs, they haven't really, you know, jumped into the whole social media bandwagon. But you, of course, uh, you know, given age on your side, uh, can do it with ease. Uh, how do you think a CEO approaching tech impacts, uh, impacts your larger perception? Technology and the use of technology, it, it's a brilliant change agent. Mm. So I think it has nothing to do with age and experience. Social media for me, as a young leader, is an opportunity for me to reach out to different people. But it can backfire in many different ways too, you know, because it is today unregulated. 
it's unverified, you know, and it gives you opportunities. I have more uh, requests of feedback coming to me on my uh, social media Twitter handle about flight delays and you know service levels, yeah. uh, and you have to figure out how you you have to have a viewpoint on how you want to deal with that. Yeah, because you are exposed, and you are uh, admittedly you you want to be exposed. So, I think again it has to synergize with you as a brand and your company as a brand. Are you saying that your social media behavior on a personal level can be mapped to you know, the company you're working for? So let's say, hypothetically, you move somewhere else. Are you saying that your social behavior will change significantly? So I, I, I don't think it changes dramatically, but it, it, is, it is contextual. I think a big part of it is your own personality. For me, at least, it's a big part of your personality. And so my, my tweets aren't always, actually very rarely, uh, are only about work and business. I'm not on any of the you know, digital sites. I'm not on social media. I don't have a Facebook account. I'm not on Twitter. Yeah. I don't do blogs. And it's very specific. It goes back to my last role and my comm site, Poonam Call. Uh, we took a serious hard look at this. And here's the catch with this. Yeah. If you don't comment in a manner which attracts attention, then you, know, you shouldn't be commenting, in a sense. True. I'm being very Absolutely. simple. Okay. Yeah. Next. The moment you comment, you divide opinion. Okay, that's the second part. Third, in India certainly, people do not distinguish between the private comment and the public comment. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. Amir Khan is a good example. Absolutely. Okay. Bang on. So now here's a CEO. Imagine if I were to post a comment. Okay, there will be divided opinion for whatever set of reasons. I don't want any of my employees or anybody in my ecosystem, even if they are with friends or partner. Hey, what did your CEO say? You know, mm. I don't want them to be ashamed of me ever. I want them to say, you know, I have a good CEO who's sensible. Okay, so it's better for me not to do this so that my people and my ecosystem is at peace with the world rather than worrying about what the CEO is going to say next. Uh, you know, I want to talk about uh, two viewpoints and one is really, uh, one theory uh, is uh, really spouted by Vivek Vadra, who's a management theorist who says that, you know, uh, in his essay he says the average age of founders of successful companies was 39 and that twice as many founders were older than 50 as were younger than 25. So he's concluded that experience trumps youth more often than many believe after he studied you know a significant set of, of, uh, of companies. Uh, would you be in agreement with that and please be candid. Yes absolutely I think see a lot of these things come from uh, a very different world. Today's world is dramatically different. The average age of a company today, the S&P 500, is 12 years. 12 years. Okay. In 1960, it used to be 60 years. So ask yourself, tomorrow it's going to be 10 years. Okay. So you really, it's not about whether you have experience of this thing. Do you have the insights? We have too much data. Mm -hmm. Do we have the insights? Can we look around the corner to say, where is this business headed? Okay, how will money be made in this business? What type of people and capabilities do we require for this business to succeed? Those are the kind of things that you need, that insights all the time. Because your time zone has shortened so dramatically. So which means what you are taking as one week for a decision, now you need to take in maybe 15 minutes. Mm. See, you have to first lead yourself, then you have to lead your team, then you have to lead your business. Mm. You have to earn all three. Yes. You can't jump from one to the other. So leading yourself, 50% of the image which people have of you is based on whether you land up on time for everything, believe it or not. Seriously? Absolutely. Okay. If you don't manage your time well, how are you going to lead a team? How are you going to lead a business? These are all small things. So the more the world changes, the more basic the principles become in order to succeed. Your viewpoint on that? No, I absolutely agree. I think... You have to disagree at some point. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. You can't be agreeing on yeah. everything. We no. disagreed that he didn't do a yeah. model with modeling was not yeah, a problem. Yeah. <laughs> now, so look, I, I think experience is important, but I don't think it trumps over youth at any given point. And I think it has to do with the way our economy and our marketplace is changing. The business that we are in today, we're in airlines today. Who knows when the Uber of airlines will come in next? That's true. So <laughs> you need to have that vision, and I think that's where the insights is very important. It's not about data, it's not. It's about how do you take everything that you can and so you can build experience under you, near you, around you, and build that going forward. But I, I don't see that experience trumps youth or youth trumps experience. I think it's very, very contextual and I think the market's changing. 
the the other thing I want to talk to you, which is a counterpoint, Ben Horowitz. He's a, he's uh, from the venture firm Anderson, and Horowitz. He laid out a counter argument that says that he prefers to invest in companies that are led by young people, because uh, he says people who tend to be younger uh, are better at finding innovative products. Uh, they are worse. Uh, than experienced CEOs at squeezing money out of these products, uh, but he argued that this, that that you know skills are easier to teach to younger people. What would you say? I would say yeah. I think in in that sense, younger people tend to be even today far more curious than uh, elderly people or older people. Okay, that's the nature of, yeah, uh, of life, etc. But turning that uh, curiosity into meaningful courage, okay, and when you want to take a bet, you need courage to do it. Not every young person with a young idea in Silicon Valley is succeeding. 90% of the firms fail almost every other day. My, my question is more basic. Why are, we, why are we separating youth and experience? Somebody who is young can have a lot of experience too. It's, it's very rare. No, it's, it's not. I think more and more. I think this is, this is the generation that's coming up. It depends on what kind of experience we're talking yeah, about. No, so we're, but let's, let's, business experience. let's play that through though. Yeah, okay. Because they, they're impatient, they're curious, mm -hmm. they want to learn, they sure. want to do different things. Sure. So while they may not spend the five years in a role mm -hmm. or in a job sure. to get that experience, they would probably spend that one. So they're going to get enough tastes of what they need and they're going to move. Now, is that enough? Again, it's the 80-20 rule again. Are they going to be 100% perfect at what they need to do? No. But they will have a lot of experience. And I see this more and more today in the young people that we are hiring, mm -hmm. that they have life experiences. They're not what the cookie cutter. What do you mean by life experience? So I have you know, people joining us who've taken gap years and who've done something with just to help society. Sure. And they've made that they've call. They've taken a sabbatical and done something. Sabbatical. Or they've decided sure. that they want to help family. Or they've lost everything because they, they made a wrong investment. That's very important to me. It's very important to me because those are skill sets you use. At its fundamental core, I always feel like when somebody has gone through rock bottom, they've learned a lot. Are you things. telling me that that's how your recruitment process is, where you look at the person's life, uh, Absolutely. Look at, uh, a, hum a human's life experience? Absolutely. And so, you don't look at, you know, what is really required No, I the think job. their technical exp uh, expertise gets them through the door. Right. But what gets them the job for me is, is always the personality, because that's fundamental to our culture. So, you know, while, you know, I think, I, mean, I think in the West, a lot, a lot of importance is, let's say, attached to, you know, going and traveling, yeah, uh, right, yeah. soaking in the sun for like a year, or doing something completely offbeat. I'm so not so sure. In the Indian context today, there is a premium attached to that. You know, uh, you, I'm glad you said it. it's funny. You know, I see a lot of people in the 30s taking a sabbatical now. Sure. Men taking sabbaticals. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a huge change because. In the context of Indian society, you think a man is the breadwinner, you know, that's a yeah. classic argument which is completely wrong. If you failed early, I'll tell you one so thing. Did you, uh, do you agree with him? His point was, why are you equating youth with experience? That's his basic argument. Yeah. Would you be in agreement with that statement? I know. See, I'll tell you here, young people. So uh, let me give you examples, tangible. In the context of a corporate life, people change a company. Okay? They go, after three years, they go to some other company. Then they call you back and say, hey, you know what? I think I made a mistake. I want to come back. You know, you know how much guts it takes to do that? That's mm. true. Think about it. But I give that person full marks because he's being very honest. He's seen the mirror and said, look, this is wrong. And whatever society we live in in a future world, uh, one thing I'm absolutely certain, there'll be a huge premium on good leadership. Huge premium, not ordinary. Okay, You're so... As opposed to the current, the current time we're in now. Absolutely, huge okay. premium. Okay, I think uh, the World Economic Forum did a survey in terms of what jobs can be taken away by you know, technology and what jobs cannot be taken away by technology. Top of the list cannot be taken away by technology, CEOs and leadership. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I want to end this show and it's uh, been very delightful for me uh, with a, a mentoring and a reverse mentoring uh, you know, uh, comment from both of you. So let me start uh, with, you know, for, let me start with the reverse mentoring. You should get on social media. <laughs> <laughs> the Facebook people keep telling me that and I'm trying to... <laughs> and, and your three mentoring tips uh, to Mithu. He's 35, he's got, you know, if he has to retire by 65, he's got 30 years to go. So all I would say is pace yourself. Pace yourself. Okay. 
Yeah. Life's been extremely good to you. You don't need to panic. Don't panic. <laughs> There's enough runway ahead of you. True. Okay, so true. in your airline parlance, set the plane right on the ground. <laughs> okay, <laughs> rev up the engines. All four and fly safe. Yeah, that's what I say. Yes, super. On that note, thank you so much, both of you. This has been truly wonderful. I hope you enjoyed, uh, you know, chatting yeah, as much as I enjoyed actually yeah. going through this. And uh, I hope to see you soon. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.